going to live stream. So I had kind of assume it's going to be going live pretty soon. And I've I will. Got, uh, uh, a notice on the screen now, so I've got it. And I think we are pretty much live. So I'm going to not, oh, I'm going to not look at you in Facebook. I'm going to look at you via Zoom. <laughs> I'm here live with Joseph O'Connor. Um, thank you so much, Joseph, for coming, for joining me today. My oh, pleasure. It's good to be here. I think many people in the group, Joseph, will know you through your NLP books. Joseph, you are um, a fabulous author, an international expert on NLP. I've certainly used your NLP handbook over, I don't, can't remember, a long time. Anyway, it's been on my, it's, yeah. it's one of the reasons I like it is it's very applicable. It's accessible and applicable. It's great, you know, really practical stuff that we can use with our clients. Good. I'd love to hear, Joseph, how, how you've, well, A, kind of how you would describe NLP in a nutshell, and then the move from looking at NLP to your, more recent stuff looking at the brain. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> In a few well, minutes. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to ramble a bit because that's my job. Um, <laughs> I, I was originally a, a professional musician and um i was very interested in in the psychological processes of what that's like because you've got to be highly skilled highly focused and take care of all the nerves you know in other words you've got to give a performance at the time as a guitarist and so i got interested in a lot of psychological approaches and um i wrote a book which was going to be a, a number of those approaches but then i got into nlp and this was in the 1980s and NLP sort of took over the book completely. It just kind of absorbed everything else that I'd prepared. And I thought, oh, that's, that bit would fit there and that bit would fit there. So it ended up actually as, as completely NLP um, with regard to uh, learning and, and playing a musical instrument, which was, which was great. And then it got me into NLP much more. And I, I think, I mean, there's a lot of definitions of NLP, uh, the, the kind of, what is it? Bandler says it's it's a it's a methodology, it's a state, a state of mind, a methodology that leaves behind a trail of techniques. Um, the kind of academic one is it's the um, study of the structure of subjective experience. In other words, you know, how do we do what we do, and, and uh, how do we mess up so spectacularly <laughs> <laughs> as well? You know, if you can understand that, then you can avoid it, and um, then. John Grinder told told a story about uh, uh, what was it? His it was his it was a, a boy and his grandmother and um, and a, the grandmother people would go up to the grandmother and say you know how are you and then she'd go Bleh, and pretty pretty bad things uh, always very grumpy and and the the grandchild would go up to her and and kind of start talking about himself and and how. How interesting it all was and, and telling her and, and uh, asking her and her face brightened and then at the end when he said well how are you granny she goes I'm great <laughs> and Grinder would say well that's NLP you know? yeah the ability to to um, be yourself and and kind of not exactly help but but uh, um, allow other people to express themselves in, in the best possible way so you know take your pick I wouldn't like to be pinned down <laughs> to to one definition. I like the bit. I think it was in coaching the brain that you talk about the linguistic bit being the how we how we talk to our brains. It's the kind of interface piece. Oh yeah, well how you know who's talking to who? That's that's what's funny about <laughs> yeah. writing a book about the brain. That's the mind blowing stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's like who's talking to who and 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 what. But yes, I mean NLP neuro, we have nerve cells and. We tend to think, well, yes, they're between here and here, but actually they're not. There's a significant um, number in the heart, for example, and there's even more significant number in the gut. And we all know that the gut can uh, communicate quite effectively with you without words because it doesn't mm -hmm. have the linguistic piece, which is just approximately here in most people. Uh, but the brain does have the linguistic piece. So the brain is able to put together 
language, uh, understand language, and put it together in a way that communicates, which is absolutely amazing. And of course, all the sense organs are, are up here. But uh, <laughs> I remember Robert Dill saying once, what would it be like if you had your eyes in your stomach and you were actually looking out at the world at that level, mm. you know, or your, or your ears, at the, you know, the side of the, <laughs> the rib cage or something like that? How would that change your consciousness? And I thought that was that was quite interesting, because although, uh, of course, the, the brain kind of takes everything for itself, um, the brain, the brain is part of the body. It's particularly yeah. good part of the body. It's absolutely necessary, but it can't live without the rest of the body. And if you take if you don't take care of your body, you certainly won't take care of your brain. And as a coach, you know, I've, I've had too many executives who, who go, yeah, just just manage. You know, I'm down to three hours sleep. And, and I think I can maybe get it down a little bit more. And I go, you know, and, you know, coach, I'm feeling a bit, you know, brain fog and unfocused. Perhaps you can help me. Or okay. we'll start with another four hours sleep for a start, because that is one of the three most important things that you can do for your brain. Get a decent night's sleep as far as you can. It's not rocket science. And like so many things that aren't rocket science, people go, oh, yeah, I know that. And then they don't. And I think knowing and doing are two different things. Oh, yeah. You know, um, that's the, the sort of holy trinity of what we can do for our, ourselves, the sleep, you know, exercise, mindfulness, taps into loads of different areas, not just um, how we can help our brains, how we can help our resilience, all of the, the well-being stuff, all, all points. We all know this stuff, but do we do it? Mm -hmm. No, sure. I'm interested in um, what you were just talking about, about our brains are just kind of a, a small part of our, our nervous system. Well, a, a significant part of our nervous system, but the, yeah. the, the linguistic part. And we've had a question into the group about how we can help our clients access the kind of embodied wisdom without necessarily relying on questions which are linguistic, but how can we help our clients go beyond that go the beyond brain. what language yeah well to sort of well, access yeah. access their gut wisdom access what they're feeling in their heart access their physical sensation how might might we move beyond just the thinking and get into the feeling well i think that the, you know the three things that certainly i found in the book and that you just mentioned um good night's sleep physical exercise and some kind of meditation practice. You do those and, and you're more than halfway there mm. yeah? because that, that does take care of the embodied part to a very large extent. And although meditation may seem, you know, a bit kind of woo and, and, uh, and not so embodied, the, the neuroscience research behind meditation actually helping your brain and body is absolutely cast iron, you know? It's better than for most things. So. It, it absolutely helps those three things. Um, with regard to, to the coach, uh, don't just pay attention to the words. This yeah. is, you know, we, we get sucked into the words. There's five communication channels of which we pay attention to the verbal one, 99%. And sometimes, you know, guaranteed then all the other channels may be <laughs> metaphorically shouting at you something but you're not noticing because you're, you're not paying attention you know there's voice tone there's um voice verbal style what's called verbal style um facial expression and body language mm. and i think a good coach um needs to to know something about those and what they can what they can express without going um to uh, kind of orthodox about them or you know if the client scratches their face then they're lying or if they <laughs> move their eyes up to the right then they're lying or something like that you know um you've always got to calibrate you've always got to to know the person to start with what's their baseline yeah because some people's baseline will be other person's complete freak out and vice versa and uh, i think sounds like this is about not making assumptions it's oh, yeah, about absolutely. really truly showing curiosity without going oh i'm curious about that scratch on the cheek it's actually what what's that you know yeah you normally it means nothing but uh if it was i'm itchy <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right 
<laughs> but if something turns up, um, particularly in facial expressions, I mean, there's these things called micro expressions that uh, because the way that our brain works emotionally, um, the emotion comes from the deeper parts of the brain and it changes the facial expression within a fifth of a second, which is outside our conscious control. So you can't actually stop that. And it's, it's not within. Turns off camera. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you, but you can't. And most people will, uh, I mean, smiling is a very good way of, of masking it, but we're talking fifth of a second here. Mm. So, uh, and we're talking about being able to recognize emotional facial expressions, which, you know, it, it takes a bit of doing, it takes a bit of training to do that. But if you can, it pays real dividends. I mean, for example, um, there was a particular executive that was was talking to me about um, uh, a barbecue that they were at. It was it was it was a Brazilian executive, and and in Brazil, barbecue Sunday barbecues are the equivalent of playing golf. You know, in other countries, between executives, they all get together. And, um, and this was a barbecue, and he was telling me about it, and he was describing it in in very good terms. You know, so very happy. He's talking with his uh, with his fellow executives and board members. And he kept flashing this um, sadness expression very, very quickly uh, as he was doing this. And um, I was noticing this. And, you know, one thing you don't do in, in that situation is to go, ha, gotcha, you're sad, you know. You, be, you it's, It was really bad that occasion, wasn't it? <laughs> and it wasn't. It was a happy occasion, right? But there were some things about it that were sad. The other trap is maybe he had a, a you know, uh, some memory came. Uh, it just provoked a memory, a sad memory from something completely different. So you don't know. You have to. Mm. Mm. So it's like uh, I would say something like, yeah, that sounds, you know, that sounds a nice occasion. And, and yet I, I keep getting this idea that there was, there was something a bit sad about it, something you, that you, you feel a bit sad about. It's, you know, anything there or, or am I imagining it? Yeah. And then it gives them freedom to to say, no, you're imagining it. That's fine. Or to think, OK, he spotted that, but I don't want to talk about it. And that's also fine. Or in this case, to actually open up a bit. And I don't think he would have opened up about this unless I had given him that opportunity uh, about the sort of problems that were going on underneath the surface. And, and he, he wasn't happy about that. So, yes, um, pay attention to everything. Because you don't know where the, the messages will be. There's something I'm skitting around what we'd agreed. Our flow. <laughs> Apologies, Joseph. But there was right, something <laughs> something in the book that you talk about, which I hadn't I wasn't familiar with, which was um an attention blink. And it got me thinking about what real coaching presence is, that real partnership of flow and paying absolute rapt attention you were talking as well about how mindfulness can help coaches be able to do that because it's it's mm -hmm. full on is there anything more perhaps you might explain what the what the attention blink is um well the attention blink is is basically when you when you focus on something or pay attention to something um when it takes a moment half a second maybe for the brain to be able to, as it were, disengage, recover, and then go on to something else. Now, that attention blink can be cut down significantly by, <laughs> uh, surprise, surprise, meditation practice. Um, but it is it is that kind of resetting of attention. So if, if you get set into something, and um, first of all, you, you are unlikely to see else what's going on, and it's there is always going to be that moment where you have to reset your attention uh, in order to, to be able to notice something else. But I, I really think that I, that's a small amount of time. It's an interesting one. But really, we, the way that we, our attention is, is notoriously fickle anyway, and we pay attention to things that we're kind of expecting. Mm. So, you know, I do this, this game sometimes in, in training where I ask people to look around the room and... and make a note of everything that they see that's red because i'm going to ask them a question about it in a few in in a couple of seconds so they look around and, and, and they notice everything and then i say okay so now close your eyes this is a memory test they all close their eyes and then i say okay now i want you to tell me everything that you noticed that was green 
and <laughs> dead silence. You see. So for the purposes of, of those few seconds when they looked round, green was invisible. Mm. It just wasn't there. Uh, it was, of course, really. But because they weren't looking for it, it wasn't there. And this is exactly how our brain works. You know, we, we dart around, we focus on things visually, auditorily, um, tactically, to, <laughs> with touch, kinesthetically. And um, we miss these things. So I think you just got to be careful about that and, and be aware of that. The more you can keep that, uh, your attention open rather than closed is yeah. probably what you're talking about in terms of that presence. It is. And it's that thing that I notice if I'm mentoring coaches, beginner coaches, you know, just trained coaches, sometimes they can kind of grasp the client might say, um, I went to a barbecue and it was great. They grasp onto the went to the barbecue. It was great. The client then goes on to say, but, you know, it really got me thinking about family that wasn't there with me and whatever, and whatever, and whatever. But the, the, the coach can be. And what was great about the barbecue? You know, it's yeah. kind of. Um, they can so i think it's a it's a paying looking a, across what's said not just picking it in, in isolation it's looking at cumulative patterns as well between sessions um and yeah scanning for the red but but noticing the green at the same time somehow which is a kind of a filtering um you don't, you don't know what color is going to be there you don't know what color is exactly. going to be important so, yeah. exactly that and that's bringing me on to another thing that you were talking about in your book which is um system one and system two thinking um and could could you in a nutshell kind of explain explain that because i think there's something really useful here about in my mind it's helping us go beyond the, the our clients patterns of thinking and help them kind of yeah, I mean, it, look you know, between uh, the green and the red. <laughs> in, in a very large nutshell, I mean, Car Daniel <laughs> Carmen wrote a, a very, very interesting and. Very uh, come on, book. Joseph, in a sentence or two, you can do this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, this is from Daniel Carmen and, and Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. If coaches haven't read that, get on with it. Read it. It's fantastic, and it's very well written as well. It's easy to read. Um, he calls System One the kind of immediate, uh, emotional type of thinking that is um, affected by impressions, but that's affected by associations and anchors, we should say, uh, quick shortcuts that normally work in life. And it's okay for most things, yeah? Um, system two is where you've got to sit back a little bit metaphorically and, and think more uh, and more deeply and more logically about what's going on because system one What's interesting about system one is it has this confirmation bias, which means it's always looking out to confirm things. So if you make a statement, system one goes, oh, how can that be true? Whereas system two goes, that's interesting. Um, how might that be disproved? In other words, it's a scientific method rather than the, the straight off, you know, oh, that's good. how can I confirm that? So system two, we need. Um, and of course, we don't want to go around all of our life analyzing things and, 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 and overthinking things. But in coaching sessions where you're talking about particularly important and significant events and occasions and, and thoughts, then this is absolutely one, uh, one place where you need to have that. So um, that means really again not jumping to conclusions but but taking a step back and listening um and for the client because the client you know client doesn't care about system one or system two client just is just thinking but certainly if i'm asking the client a question and they answer straight away what goes on in my head is oh that sounds like system one that sounds like the ready-made sort of quick answer mm. um, that they know very well about but that's useless here because they come to a coach precisely because they don't know, you know, what they know is they, they don't know what they don't know. So I will say something like, OK, well, well, that's good. Um, now, give me another answer. Give me your best answer. Mm. I want you to really think about this. Right? 
So we don't dismiss that answer because it, it's an answer and it has some truth to it. But there are many others. And if you if you dig down there, um, you'll often come back with, with something much better. We'll always come back with something much better. There's uh, what I call a Leonardo strategy from Leonardo da Vinci, um, who was pretty creative sort of guy, really. <laughs> Uh, and uh, when he was posed a problem he would uh, not stop until he got three solutions even if the first one was brilliant mm. he'd go okay well that's fine uh, now I want another one and then a third so as they used to say in NLP if you if one choice isn't a choice at all uh, two choices is a dilemma and uh, you only really have choice if you have three choices yeah yeah no I, I like that i th i think um it, it's that going beyond the looking for the red which is the shortcut and easy in a crowd especially at the moment you know we've got so many distractions uh i know from the people that i'm coaching there's an expectation about the way th that feels like the way people are working has really changed probably because as a result of the pandemic you know um and yet actually noticing the green is important and i think probably our role as coaches is to help question around that and to think what's yeah, being missed here multicolored coaches haven't we we have <laughs> we have um i've missed something that's really important here which you know as coaches we often think about goals with our clients um, I'm an ICF coach. Our language has changed slightly in our new competency framework. We're now really focusing on growth. But I'd love to hear a bit about the neuroscience of goals. Yeah. Um, it, it's part of the coaching the brain course that I do. Um, I mean, goals is a funny word. And, and in many ways, it's it's not quite or it, not necessarily right um it's quite limited you know in terms of in terms of goals i would say that in terms of goals there's, there's the goal whatever that is that you're heading for there's the the person the 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 goal scorer as it were or, or the potential goal scorer and then there's the relationship between them mm. uh so and i think what tends to happen uh, a lot is that people get um fixated on the goal out there in the future and it becomes something that's rather separate something rather dissociated mm. uh, and they forget about themselves the person who wants it why do they want it you know of all the things they could possibly want why that uh you know and and what else can't they have as because of that mm. um and all those sorts of questions and then the relationship uh whether you're thinking about achieving a goal, whether you're thinking about attracting a goal, whether you're thinking about uh, creating a goal, because I like to think of of goal goals in terms of getting goals. I, I, I like to think of it as creative problem solving, because that's how the brain approaches it, basically. Uh, and I think the, the more we can use our brain's creative powers in order to um move forward to things that that we want certainly and uh, things that are worthwhile and ecological and, and valuable and um, the better it's going to be rather than than focus on the thing out there you know smart we we know about smart goals and all of that sort of thing but it amazed me smart as a technology if you can call it a technology is about 50 years old yeah so i think we can we can move on a bit from there i think smart is about planning for a goal rather yeah. than embodying a goal well it's smart supposed to be uh, a number of characteristics of goals uh, that you need to to get you know beat them into shape <laughs> in order to have a chance at getting them of course it doesn't quite work like that you're, you're changing your thinking about it um but i do think it, it's very different um when you think about creating something because then you're you're put in the role of author you know you when you think about i am creating this goal first of all you're in the present tense mm. yeah and you acknowledge your part in that process which is an ongoing process in a series of moments until 
maybe you get the goal. I mean, there's no mm. guarantee, but maybe you will, maybe you won't. Um, but the, the fixation on that point in the future and the attachment to it uh, is one of those things that that's it's it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work in terms of being s smart or, or actually you know getting there, and it doesn't work in terms of the way we are as human beings and, and our emotional and spiritual lives. And we forget about the journey because yes. the journey, you know, you think about a goal and uh, whatever it might be. Uh, there, there's going to be a time if you get that, let's say you do, and you'll feel great uh, winning the lottery. Wow, fantastic. You know, win the lottery. Absolutely. No problem with that. Uh, and you're going to feel fantastic. And then you're a millionaire. OK, great. And then you decide what to do and it's all good fun. And uh, after about six months, or so it's like okay i'm a millionaire well, well uh, what now I, why don't i feel any happier <laughs> I, I seem to have even more problems than i used to mm -hmm. have you know no <laughs> it doesn't have to have to be so but the interesting thing there is that um the way our brain works is that we are all um natural naturally we want to get things new things yes we do and these things will be worthwhile but as soon as we got them that the feeling fades and then the new you know the next new thing the new next best thing comes along and that's what the brain's but it's just programmed for that uh you can get used to anything you know you're a millionaire well uh, how about 10 million you know, how about billion i want to be a billionaire you know well i've got enough money now and i want the perfect you know house relationship moon rocket trip to mars whatever it might be there's there's no limit to it and that's great you know absolutely not against that you've just got to recognize that every goal is a stepping stone to dissatisfaction to the next dissatisfaction so it would be uh and i think this is very important in coaching that you focus on the journey that you're going to take because that's something that you have much more control over Mm. And the metaphor I love there is there's a picture I saw in the paper a year or two ago, and it's the top of Mount Everest. And, uh, you know, the, the good metaphor for a goal. Yeah, I'm gonna climb Mount Everest. Right? I'm going to get to the top of Mount Everest. Fantastic achievement. Top of the world, you know. Talk about it at dinner parties uh, for years after that. And when you think about that, OK, uh, you'll be at the top of Everest. OK, for how long? Five minutes, 10 minutes? I saw this picture there's a queue there's yeah. a queue to the top of mount everest you know in in the high season as it were people just waiting come, come on down you know <laughs> my turn to get up there so you'll be there i don't know a couple of minutes say and then you've got to go down and the planning and the the climb up and the climb down is going to take you months so you better focus on that and make sure that you're you're happy and uh, up to that rather than focusing on those few seconds at the top. And I think that metaphor is is very appropriate for many goals. Absolutely. And um, Joseph, I think, you know, you've done what, a goal for many people is writing a book, actually, and you've oh, done yeah. it numerous times. And I have to say, done it extremely, oh, just that I'm saying to you about your writing style. So, well, it full of humor, full of wisdom, accessible just gets the balance right so highly recommend Thank your you. books joseph what are you working on right now <laughs> um <laughs> something completely different i'm writing a science fiction novel oh i'm about halfway through and uh it's absolutely wonderful fun it's quite different from writing non-fiction because with non-fiction it's you know you, you 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 get organized absolutely and, and you you get things together and you also realize that you've got to write uh at least two or three chapters before you realize you're on the wrong track and and then that tells you where you've got, actually got to start that, that always happens and then you, you know you rearrange it and it's fine but with writing fiction um i never i never believed this before when fiction writers said it but it's like the characters take over yeah it's like, you know you you start with something and then the, the character suddenly goes and does something that that you you hadn't really planned for them but it's absolutely right and then that leads you into other stuff so it's like it it writes doesn't write itself but it it's 
it's a process that is really, really interesting, and I'm enjoying it very much. So I'm hoping that uh, my the novel Consensual Reality will, will hit the, the bookshelves, I don't know, in a couple of years' time, maybe. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm uh, writing at the moment. Great stuff. There was just as we wrap up, you wanted to talk as well a little bit about mental models. Is there anything else that you feel that we need to think about there? Well, mental models, yeah. I mean, I, I do the coaching this coaching the brain um certification course, um uh, neuroscience coaching. And it's divided into three modules: goals, neuroscience of goals, neuroscience of values and emotions, and neuroscience of beliefs, because mm. those are the three things basically that coaches deal with. Uh, but beliefs is a kind of strange word, really. Uh, I prefer mental models. And a mental model is basically a prediction that we make as a result of ex our experience in the past about what's going to happen to us. And we have these mental models about ourselves, about the world, about other people. And um, they're not bad. You know, they get us through the day. We, we couldn't possibly live unless we could make some reliable predictions about what's going to happen. You know, I pick up this glass of water. And if I couldn't make a reliable prediction about what's going to happen to it when I drink, I, I wouldn't know what to do. You know, it's, it explode in my hand, uh, move upwards. So we need those. But of course, in terms of coaching, uh, what coaches deal with really is only these mental models. Mm. We can't change, we can't change them directly. We can't change the other people in their life. We can't change the world or circumstances or economics or anything like that. We can only deal with the mental models that the client has about what is happening to them. So if we call those beliefs, then that's really important. And the the neuroscience of beliefs in terms of oh sorry, excuse me. Sorry, I have a very loud phone. <laughs> um, so this is this is I, I've coaching. Oh, sorry, let me mute it. Um, as co as we say, in coaches, it's it's not the the problem is not the problem. The problem is the way that we're thinking about the problem. You yeah. think about it differently. Uh, it doesn't isn't the problem anymore. Maybe. Who knows? But it's different. So how the brain uh, comes up with these predictions and, and how it works with them and all the tricks and traps that we have of our thinking, uh, including system one and system two. System one and system two uh, and the way that the brain works um, and the way that we fool ourselves and, and the way that we forget information and and confirmation bias and all of these things are, are really fascinating and really important for coaches to know um, so that we can help our, our clients literally move mental models into something that works better for them. I think even an awareness of our mental models and our clients' mental models is helpful here, even if shifting them sometimes seems almost too onerous or too overwhelming, but actually an awareness helps that actually, well, I'm, I'm filtering things through this lens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Joseph, thank you so much for today. Okay, pleasure. That's I'm going good. to um, drop some links in into the chat and there may be some questions that um, I'll, I'll tag you. So hopefully yeah, sure. you okay. might get some questions. I'm going to stop the live stream now and stay on the line for a second with me. Okay. I'm going to stop the live stream now, clunkily probably. Okay. <laughs>